All right, this is Jim Carney. I'm here with David Amran at Farm Aid 2018. How are you doing, David? Fine, Jim. It's good to see you. And great to be back at Farm Aid right here in East Hartford, Connecticut. It's our decade anniversary. We met at 2008 Farm Aid. Boy, it, seemed, it seems like yesterday, or maybe the day before yesterday. A couple of pounds ago. <laughs> uh, but, you know, you look great. 87 now. Yeah, I'll be 88 November 17th. And did they, uh, did you say they're working on uh, David Amran 90 film now? Or <laughs> Well, no, I, I was supposed to write a, a book called David Amram, The First 80 Years, and they made the film, but I couldn't get the book done on time. So the publisher said, why don't you make it David Amram the next 80 years? <laughs> so I'm starting to work on that now, and starting on my 80th birthday, which was a while ago, and describing where I happened to be by coincidence, they were playing my ode to Lord Buckley, a saxophone concerto on that very day that I turned 80, mm. which I didn't even ever know was going to happen. So I'm, I'm trying, my hope is that it can encourage younger people to be patient, to hang in there, and realize that they're over 24 years old and their career counselor says, you're washed up because you don't have your own entertainment complex in the skyscraper. Mm. That's fine, but it's just like if you have a bad medical condition, get a second opinion because if you get a second opinion you realize that Moses was in the desert 40 years so there's no rush and secondly if you do a good job work hard love what you're doing keep trying to improve you have your whole lifetime to work at it whatever you have to do to pay your rent has no bearing on your value as an artist or a person if you're not in the art it takes patience and, and perseverance yeah. and secondly if you're lucky enough to have any appreciation share those blessings with other people principle really of work. comes back to you doesn't it in ways that you can't imagine yeah it's more fun it's good for your health and it's a humbling experience because then you realize you got to be with people that can help you to develop and you find there's a lot of people smarter or more talented than you'll ever be and you'll know that you should be hanging out with them and in exchange for that they'll hang out with you and partake of your desires, encourage you, and then you can pass that on to other people, and your whole life has some meaning, mm. other than looking at the mirror and being angry. You know, I, I, I want to tell people about, you and I corresponded before Farm Aid this year, and you told me about your project where you um, kind of, it, it's almost like a, a, a love letter to uh, people that you worked with and you you admired in yeah. different movements. Can you tell me who did you pay tribute to and wh what that project was about and, and they're all that? Yeah, well, the two that I told you about, one was was extraordinary, like so many things in my life, just a miracle. Elmira Darvarova, this great violinist, she was the first woman concert master in the Met. I met in 1984, around that time, or maybe it was later, in uh, the Grand Park Symphony. I was conducting, and she was an incredible violin. She said, no, I'm the first woman concert master in the Met. I said, wow, I never forgot her. Years later, she started a New York Chamber Music Festival, and she liked my music, and she did it. So we worked together, and I wrote a piece for her uh, called Three Lost Loves, and it was uh, works of, Ed, of a great, great woman writer, who wrote My Antonia. Then the second one was Zora Neale Hurston's uh, The Eyes Watching God. And the third one was Jack Kerouac's uh, one about the Mexican girl. And she recorded that for a tiny label of all my chamber music, which she played in. And amazingly enough, this tiny little company is distributed by Naxos Records. So for the first time as I hit 88, they had me up for about three or four awards for Grammys. I never Rough even knew. Time. I just watched the Grammy on television. I never thought I had anything to do, or didn't have a clue what you even do to apply for a Grammy. Yep. And now this big record company is doing it. So instead of being thrown in the wastebasket, there'll be somebody on my behalf that I didn't even know. And I ne that never would have happened if Elmira hadn't liked the music enough to have me write a piece for her. And I mentioned that only because my hope is that young composers and young instrumentalists will find one another. Secondly, that young composers, young instrumentalists, and young people, and their parents, 
will check out things like Farm Aid and see that our indigenous American music of the blues and country music and jazz, that's great music, sincere music, exquisite choice of notes, purity of intent, built to last. That's all good, valuable stuff. And not to be discouraged. And if people say, well, there's no the young people today, no. Man, how can you expect the young people today to do anything after 50 years of the tsunami of swill dumped upon them constantly? Yeah. And the amazing thing is a lot of young people now, with thanks to the collapse of the entertainment industry, are beginning to discover for themselves what they feel is worthy. And with YouTube, they can see the old masters who were put in the dumpster or never acknowledged, and they can see people of their own age and younger also out there doing it. I am always mentoring a young musician or two. Yeah. So I would say and for it, anybody, so and when I go to these different colleges, whether I'm there as a classical composer, conductor, or yeah. playing back up as I did with Jack Kerouac and company, the poet, or playing jazz or folk music, whatever role I'm in, I always say, when people say, well, you're so optimistic and you're telling people, encouraging them, don't you realize there's no market, there's no audience, there are too many musicians, too many poets, too many composers, too many playwrights, too many dancers, not enough gigs. I say there's never too many sunsets, never enough beauty. Amen. So if you love it and you feel you were put, put here to do something, Follow that calling. And if you have a day job, that's no crime. All the people that I see now in the books that I am go out and work on their behalf, we all had day jobs. I'll be 88 in, in the two months, so most of the artists, it was assumed you'd have a day job, yep. and you were an artist too, and you somehow managed. Raymond Carver. Yeah. Had every day job. Boy. And all the crappy ones. And Char right. Charles Ives, speaking of the state of Connecticut, the great composer was founded the Hartford <laughs> Insurance, the, the insurance company, because he needed a gig. And he was a great composer, but he realized, well, he was going to keep writing that music, but there was no way he could even make a nickel doing that. Yep. So by the time he finally got acknowledged, he was in the 70s, and the famous thing was they said, Mr. Ives, we would like to give you the Outstanding Achievement Award. He said, no. They said, what? They said, no. He said, awards are the badges of mediocrity. Well, I wouldn't go that far. When I get an award, I say, thank you. I got this award last year from Farm Aid. So I said, first of all, I had it on my wall. I only brought it so I could be sure to get in the place if we have to park. But I said, you know, I just said, thank you when I get the award. I don't mention that there are other people that deserve it more than I will. And conversely, I don't get jealous if someone else gets the award. Right. And so my kids would say, well, daddy, so-and-so got this and that, and you didn't. Why is that? I said, because they chose them instead of me. Next, case dismissed. Right. The main thing is to do a good job, love what you're doing, and respect and encourage others. Then you'd be cool. No ego, that's why I dig you, David. Well, you know, <laughs> People said to me, one time someone said, you're very humble. I said, man, I got plenty to be humble about. I knew, I knew and still know some fantastic people who are so amazing. I'm just lucky to be in their presence. That's why I love coming here, just sitting in and playing with Willie Nelson's band every year. Yeah, yeah. Willie sure doesn't need me to do what he's been doing all his life. So it's an honor to be with him. So my job is just to try to see how I can add a little bit, fit in, and not hog the scene. But there was clear affection when he greeted you this morning at the press conference. Yeah, well, that's because he yeah. knows I respect him. Yeah. And and uh, and I appreciate his commitment to farmers, to people, his graciousness towards everyone who crosses his path, and his incredible ability as a musical artist. He's a fantastic guitar player, singer, songwriter. Watch out, Django. Yeah, and he's such he a... He steals all the best Django stuff. I know, and he's, <laughs> such, and he's such a wonderful guy. And he's a role model for how all of us should behave on and off the bandstand, mm. and for those who aren't musicians to be the same way. He Amen. was brought up on a farm, and I was too, so we learned that as kids. Yeah. You work hard, you say thank you, you remain humble, 
and you try to appreciate each other's and you try to always do a good job and do better than is expected. All those old fashioned values, yeah. man, that stuff has always remained hip because it's based on the truthfulness. I respect any man who can, you know, under promise and over deliver. Amen. With a firm handshake, <laughs> old school. That's it. Well, I told, I presented Jamie Johnson, an incredible singer, with his, because he got this award that I got last year. So they had me, and I said, you know. I'm a recent fan, and I love the guy. He's, really. he's incredible. And I said, you know, what I learned when I was living up on our little farm, and my dad's farm in Feasterville, Pennsylvania, since I mowed the lawn at the gas station across the street, I was part of the inner circle. I could go, as a little nine-year-old hear all those farmers talking. Mm -hmm. I said, you can't fool your partner in life, you can't fool your kids, you can't fool the band, and you can't fool farmers. So you get the real deal, and you can carry that with you all your life. So my hazy hick DNA when I moved to the asphalt jungle in 1955, I was ready, whatever happened, somehow to have some kind of a core so that if something really seemed disgusting, dishonorable, and wrong, I didn't go and say, oh, I guess that's okay, and that's the way I should be in order to get this or that. I said, no, no, there's a right way to try because to Because you were around it. the people that went through that bebop era that they, they lost their souls for a time or completely. Well, I was around people who who you weren't that? Who, I was. I was with the people who weren't that way, yeah. and those are the ones well, that I knew were right, way, and I could sure. feel that because they, they were like the people who were the farmers that I knew as a kid. Mm. They said, "There's no shortcuts. You've got to milk that cow and finish to the last drop. You can't fool the cow and pour some water in the in the in the pail. Yep. You know, you have to do the job and do it well, and then go on and do the next one." And, those are basic old-time values that apply to everything you do in life. Yeah. Try to, what did you say, un, over deliver? What was, under promise and over deliver. Under promise and over deliver, I love that. And, and that's nothing complicated, but it's different than the idea of, when I did the music for Manchurian Candidate, I was offered seven films. I said, wow, I can be a millionaire. I was only 31 years old, and scarcely. But then I said, well, wait a minute. I can't write that much music, orchestrate it, which I did, conduct it, do everything, choose the musicians, play in it, and do a good job. And they looked at me like I was some kind of a, you know, mentally challenged person. And they said, that's why you have your ghostwriters and your orchestrators and your staff. I said, I don't use a ghostwriter. I write my Set own up music. Quincy Jones did it. Yeah, I said, I said, no, I said, I don't use an orchestrator. I orchestrate my own music. And I don't have a staff. I do this stuff myself. Maybe get someone to copy it. But I do it all myself. And they looked at me like I was a sword maker. And I said, well, you know, I couldn't criticize anybody that does things that way. And if I loved playing golf or sailing more than I loved music, maybe I would say, okay, I can make a living doing that. I said, I'm gonna take the hopeless hard way and go back to what I love to do. And that was a long 1962. Now that score's out there, still shining, and the film is, and I'm doing, I'm just finishing up a symphony, a new symphony piece called I was just gonna ask Partners. You, how long does it take David Amran to chart a a symphonic score well, of this, an original Well, symphony. this one I'm just finishing up be... after a year and a half, and it's it's uh, called Partners for Cello, Violin, and Orchestra. First movements in memory of Woody Guthrie from Okima, Oklahoma. That's his sister, hmm. his younger sister. She's still alive at 94. And, and, uh, and Woody was a Mayflower descendant. He came all the way from Okima, met Pete Seeger at Harvard, he dropped out of Harvard. I've seen Woody's daughter also play on Farm Aid. Oh, she's right around '99. Yeah. I think they both were on it, weren't they? Yeah, they're they're pretty girl. The whole Talented. family is is like incredible. That's his granddaughter, Sarah oh, May. Yeah. yeah, she's incredible, and, and the whole family yeah. is uh, the whole Guthrie family are all amazing. Arlo, all of them, and the younger ones, yeah, Krishna, Arlo's daughter, and, right. and the Willie's daughter, and. Uh, Senior moment, I'm only 48. Partner. No, you know, they're all 
and such nice people. Yeah. And the second movement is in memory of Lester Young and Billy Holiday, and I knew both of them when I was playing with Mingus. I met all of them. And then the third one is for Machito and Celia Cruz. And I happen to know all six of them. They were all nice to me and every young person that crossed their path, because I was a young person then mm. when I met them. They were great musical partners, and each movement takes the genre, based on the genre of music that I knew from playing and being with them, yeah. and putting it in a symphony piece so the people who read off the paper can pick up their instruments, saw away, and be part of that world. And Lester touched me in round midnight, like you can't believe. It. Oh, isn't that great? You, you know, I, I had similar relationship with other musicians. Yeah. You know, in my life, and then to, when I finally saw that film, and then I remember someone asked Lester, "How did you nail that? You're not an actor. You did the, your first film." Yeah. He says, "I didn't have to act." That was my life. Yeah. I'm sure you were aware that. Oh that, yeah. That, that and he was fab. That. He was fabulous. Amazing. And he was some great player too. Yeah. Oh God, yes. And, and as much as we love Gene Ammons and him, there was uh, Arn, Arnett Cobb. He was also one of the masters, and they they have some together with all those guys playing. But now with YouTube, you could see Arnett Cobb as well, and you can also see. Uh, some of the beautiful people that, that that play Wardell Gray and some of those fantastic players, the kind of Lucky Thompson, he, when I played with Oscar Pettifer's band, Lucky was there. Mm -hmm. I mean, these were master musicians, yeah. and thanks to the internet, you can see, mostly shot in, in Europe and Scandinavia in the 60s, 50s, 60s, and 70s, because those people saw jazz as an art form. Yeah. And they recorded those people as well as they recorded. And those symphony. Willie Dixon tours, the folk blues Fabulous. tours to Europe, and the German television stations oh, that yeah. used to film them. It looks like high def but black and white. Yeah, and and the, the sound is great. Amazing. And, and, and you know, in music, as you Big Mama and, Thornton in, in, yeah. in, in the sound stage at the train station, and you, I can see it right now. It's so beautiful. Yeah. And you know, the, the, those in music. You can see it as well as here. When you see yeah. you see Duke Ellington playing it, addressing his band, mm. when you see Bill Evans, how serious he was really looking, always, you know, thinking. When you see as well as hear those people, mm. you can see, man, this is some really great stuff going on. And young people who weren't lucky enough to be around. My 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 YouTube, my you know, cyberspace. Was the University of Hangoutology? I was right. there, I was there at three in the morning, either playing or seeing or bumping into people I met, and being able to be around them. Now, you can see not only the great jazz and folk and blues players, but also the classical jazz, like Dimitri yeah. Metropolis, the great Greek conductor. Can literally travel around the world yeah. and go to the Montreux Festival. Yeah, I, I dedicated but, my know. book to Dimitri Metropolis. I said I want to check him out, see why I loved him so much. Now I'm watching him as someone approaching 80. Now I can really understand what he's doing better than I could when I knew him as a kid and he yeah. encouraged me to be a composer and conduct and all that stuff too. I can understand where he was coming from because I know enough to see what he was doing then yeah. and see how amazing that was. And I can hear Duke Ellington and Miles and all those people that I knew as a kid and Charlie Parker and appreciate them more. And a younger person could start out at 14, 13, 12, and then they could see some 13, I can't, can't remember the guy's name from England, some young kid, he sings all the parts, writes the music, plays all the instruments. Mm. I mean, I said, good Lord, I don't know how anybody could even sing that stuff. He sings all six parts with all those harmonies, plays all the instruments, I mean, and writes the music himself. There's a lot of gifted people there, and now, we can receive their gifts and then turn the computer off and go to the University of Hangout Turn off the screen time too. And you can see there's a lot of other people out there that want something better. And that applies to society in general. So when you see these young kids doing the urban garden like we did today at well, Urban they were Farming, marvelous, marvelous. they're not up there saying we want to you know, burn the building down of the corporation. They're saying, 
let's see if we can do something to make things better. And in a small way, adding something to society. And that's our hope, that the, the reawakening, that's what their definition of a and renaissance. And they got the, the, the social justice yeah. aspect of the farming and the, the supply chain and the food. Sure, exactly. They, and they're so young, they, they get it. And it's not demonizing other people. It's simply a question of common sense, what's right and what's wrong. Mm, and elevating what, all of us. And like what could be better. And, and for the children, the, rest. the young people, if they say, look, this is healthier for what we eat, how we behave, who we choose as our representatives, how we have our schools, how we have our roads, how we take care of our old and young people. There are a lot of countries that do that. And we're about to move more and more in that direction. And it takes time. And it's not a question of saying all oh, these other people have to go to prison or they're our enemies. That's not it. They'll go out of business if nobody's buying their stuff. And if they do, then they can figure out, maybe I better learn how to work for my living and do a good day's work. They'll go back to the grammar school that we came out of of how to try to do something in your life besides rip off other people. And there'll always be people doing that too. Oh yeah. But the, stealing the hubcaps off a car won't be considered to be the guidebook of how to conduct your life. No, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> David, I, I could keep you all day, but uh, I gotta get back to work. And all right. I know that you got to visit with your pals and. I know you, I, I don't want to be the guy who's in trouble for oh, keeping you from that. organizing your set. No, actually, I'm, I'm correcting my score for the last movie of the piece and giving it to the poor music cop. I shouldn't take poor, he's a great friend and great copy. For the final, 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 I'm putting stuff in red for, for corrections number 37 and getting that done while I'm here. Oh my goodness. And using the Do back. Do you ever stop? Well, you I did. the most prolific guy. Well, people said, don't you get tired? I said, well, I took a nap in 1957, <laughs> and it gave me a terrible headache. <laughs> You're the best. Well, it's good to see you. Dan. It's always great you. to see you, Thanks. and I love staying in touch, yeah. even though we lose touch every once in a while. Well, if you're ever up in Beacon, New York, I only have a few tomato plants. I don't have a farm anymore. Well, I'll get the chicken shit and we'll fertilize them. That's all right. <laughs> it's, it's good to see you. Great to see you, David. You Thank too. you so much. Okay.